preach on heaven, and I'll give a little more introduction on that after I pray. But Revelation chapter number 4. After this I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I hope you see the capitalization of the word one. And he that sat to look upon like a jasper, a sardine stone, there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. They had on their heads crowns of gold. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within. They rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and they worship him that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now your blessing on the preaching of the word. Lord, may it be an opportunity this morning, Lord, to, to, to look again at this glimpse of heaven. Lord, it's a place that we better be uh, familiar with. And Lord, I hope and pray that it's a place that everyone here has made a, a plan to spend eternity there. And so, Lord, as we take this time this morning to look at a glimpse of heaven, Lord, may we be reminded of that which you are preparing for us, of that place that you have uh, uh, made a, a place, a, a little uh, abode for us each there in heaven for eternity. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that you give me the opportunity this morning to share that which you've laid upon my heart. We thank you. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. I've uh, just been preaching through three messages over the last three Sunday mornings uh, about a church that's ready for eternity. And so I think each of those three messages, especially maybe last week, um, uh, was, was one that would step on toes, right? On all of our toes. Are we ready? Are we where we should be? Hopefully we're not lukewarm. Uh, we cer certainly should not be dead. We should be ready for the soon coming return of Jesus Christ. Today's message, I, I hope, maybe will be more, more encouraging. And that is, not, in other words, not so much stepping on toes, uh, but a little more uplifting this morning in the fact, I want to take a moment to talk about heaven and what heaven is all about and, and that place that's being prepared for us. And if we're uh, spending a few weeks like we did looking at the importance of making sure we are ready for when he returns, well, where is it that we're going when we die? Where is it we're going when the rapture comes and he calls us home? What is this place? What does the Bible tell us about it? We have some information. As we come here to Revelation chapter 4, we, we know that uh, the book of Revelation begins with John being given a vision of things to come. And in the first couple of chapters here, uh, there's these letters to the seven churches, uh, reminding them, preparing them, correcting them, uh, giving them some um, uh, accommodation to some of the things they had done right, but then warning them for some things they've done wrong. But then we come to chapter 4. And as we come to chapter 4 and chapter 5, the, the tenor of the book changes. The message of the book changes. Uh, the first couple, written to Christians, written to churches, be prepared, work on these things. But in chapter number 4, we see a dramatic change, and that is that uh, John is given a glimpse into heaven. 
into heaven itself. So what is this, this heaven? I, it's obviously a place where God's presence is on display. Uh, we know that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. There's no place that is absent from God. So what makes heaven different? And the answer would be heaven is a place where God's full glory is on display. And it's a place where God's throne is. So that would separate it from, obviously, earth. I, we are created, and we see this even in the passage as we got down to the end of chapter 4. We're created to bring glory to God, and we're created for God's glory. But clearly, God's glory is not on full display on the earth that we live in. In fact, we know that Jesus Christ, when he came from heaven to spend the time as a human, as a man on this earth, as he took on flesh, divine nature, but he took on flesh and dwelt among us, he put off the glory of heaven. It was something that those at the transfiguration got a glimpse of for just a little bit, right? Those that were on the mountain with, with Jesus saw him in his glory for those few moments on the mountain. But as he walked around, he was in humanity. If you walked by Jesus Christ on the street, he wouldn't have looked any different than anyone else. And the Bible tells us that. There was nothing significant about his appearance to draw attention to him. His message attracted great crowds. But there was nothing significant to see about him that would set him apart from anyone else on earth. But John is able to see something that you and I will see someday and have not obviously been able to see yet, and that is the full glory of God as he sees the throne of heaven and is able to see a glimpse of what the throne must be like. I started by talking about the song we sang early in the uh, service today, My Savior, First of All. Fanny Crosby, as Brother Lennington said, wrote that being a, a person who was blind, who couldn't see. And the very first thing she wanted to see was Jesus. The first thing she wanted to see, not her, not her, her family or her, her, her loved ones or those who cared for her, those were important. But the very first thing that she wanted to see when her eyesight was restored in a heavenly body was to see Jesus first. And as John is given a glimpse into heaven, he sees the glory of God surrounding the throne. And we see something that I think, I think we would agree, John's words inspired by the Holy Spirit, given us the clearest depiction possible, but I think John would tell us his words and descriptions were limited by human understanding. And as he wrote, he said, it was like this and kind of like that and kind of had the face of this, but it was, un God's voice, he said, was thundered like a trumpet as he spoke. Something different than you and I have anything to really relate to or, or can give. He did the best description he could with the the limitations of humanity. And I think that's one of the things we need to keep in mind as we talk about heaven is, is these are things that are greater, broader, deeper, more than our human understanding can comprehend. And we always try to put a human element on a divine nature and a divine God and a divine presence, and that's hard to do. And of course it is. We, we're limited to our human understanding. But John sees a number of things. Let me just, I know I read through, I'm going to just highlight a few things as we go down. But he says in verse number one there, come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So these are things to come. And I think that's important because it's not, listen, I think this is significant. John is not witnessing a live event. He's witnessing an event, especially in chapter number five. We're going to get to that. He's witnessing an event that's going to happen in the future, in future time. And I think that's a time that you and I are going to be a witnesses of. We're going to be here with John, with the believers from all past. We'll be standing before the throne to witness the events of chapter 5. So these are things that are going to happen. And John's able to see that. He says in verse number 3, He that sat on that throne... He mentions it in verse 2. He that sat on that throne was as a jasper and a sardine 
stone. Uh, so jewels and emeralds and, and, and the glistening of the, of, of the um, uh, uh, again, trying to put a human element on something that was magnificent in its appearance, something different than John had witnessed before. And I have to point out in verse number three there, there was a rainbow around about the throne. I, I'm going to go here. It's June. I can't, I'm, I'm about sick and tired of seeing the rainbow misused this month, as we do every June. I'm tired of it. It's on everything that, that depicts perversion today. God Almighty set the rainbow in the sky, starting with Noah, to, as a promise, as a, as a commitment, as a covenant between God and man. And to see it misused and mis, misinterpreted, and that's, that's, I'm being generous with that, but seeing it misused today to depict an a, a ungodly lifestyle, Listen, when we stand before the throne, this is important. God says surrounding the throne will be a, a rainbow. It's going to be in, in the way it's supposed to be, set the way it's supposed to be, uh, signifying what it's supposed to signify, used properly as God has ordained it. I, I find it, here we go, I find it extra repulsive and repugnant that they took a promise and a symbol from God and misused it, misdiagnosed it, mis, mis, misrepresented it to signify something that is of sin. How, man must be accountable for that someday. So we stand before the throne and we see the rainbow over top of the throne. God set it in the sky and God put it over top of the throne of God. How dare we, how dare we misinterpret it? Verse number, verse number four. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. That's four and twenty elders clothed in white raiment. I'm not going to get into all this today. Who are those twenty-four? We don't know specifically. Some believe it might be the twelve apostles plus uh, twelve representatives from the twelve tribes of Israel, Old Testament, New Testament, maybe. We don't know who all they are. Out of the throne, verse 5, lightnings and thunderings and voices. I mean, I... Again, I just, want to, I just want to caution those that say someday when they stand before God and they're going to give God a piece of their mind, right? Isn't that the mindset? Well, when I stand before God, I'm going to ask him why he did this and tell him what I thought about this. And uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, it looks to me like before the throne, there is thunderings and lightning. Uh, it, is, it is significant. It is overwhelming. It should be intimidating to human nature. Um, verse number six, there was a sea like of, of glass like crystal, and then we see these four beasts. Now, these are things we don't see on earth, right? What are these four beasts? One has a face like a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. We don't know what, uh, uh, you know, John had nothing else to describe them. They're like this, they're kind of like that, but these are these beasts that are in heaven that are different than what we have here on earth. And he says in verse number eight, they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. He's the Alpha and Omega. And it's the job of these four unique beasts that John sees to do nothing but signify the holiness of God continuously. It says in verse 9, The beasts give glory and honor to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. Verse 10, the, the 24 elders fall down. They worship him that liveth forever and ever. They cast their crowns. Verse number 11, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Again, I just, I thought it was important that we diagnose chapter number four to kind of get a view of what the throne of heaven is like. Again, uh, we have this artist depiction or this 
cultural mindset of a God who's an old man sitting in a rocking chair, right? That's not what I see in chapter number four. That's not what John saw as he saw a glimpse of heaven. Uh, it is uh, unlikely, and I think I'm being generous there, unlikely that one would be able to speak as they stand before the Almighty God. Chapter number five, I want to look at that. Chapter number five, we see a significant event unfold. And I, I find chapter number five an emotional chapter. And as I have preached this or read this before, my voice has cracked and the emotion of it should overwhelm us and it overwhelmed John. It's why it's recorded here for us as we see the significance of this event unfold. For chapter five, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside and sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. This is what John says as, he, as he's watching. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion, capital L, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. He came, he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, listen, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. I beheld, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beast, the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. The four beasts said, Amen. The four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Chapter number six, he opens the book. But what, a, what an event to witness. And I think we see there the, the three persons of God. We see the, in chapter number four, the, the seven lanterns being the spirit of God and the seven seals being the seals that were sealed by the spirit of God. Of God, We see the, the one on the throne which, whose voice preceded the lightnings and the thunders and the voice of a trumpet. And we see the one who was as a lamb slain, who was the one able to take the book from the one that was on the throne and had the, had the power and the only one able to open the book. We see the three persons of God. I watched a, um, a round table a couple months ago, a number of preachers talking about when we get to heaven, will we see uh, one, one image of God, one God? Will we see the three persons of God? I, I don't know the answer to all that. I don't think we really know how to understand or comprehend that. But in this particular event, we see the three persons of God. We see the three persons of God on display. And there was only one that was able to open the book. There was only one that, listen, all of our good works are worthless at that moment. It is no wonder we throw our crowns back at his feet. It's no wonder we see the elders do that here. 
And we will do that at the judgment seat of Christ. Whatever reward we have, we throw back at his feet. He's the only one worthy enough. He's the only one that can open the book. What, what, a, what a powerful thing that is. So, I want us to have a picture of heaven. And I wanted to start with the picture of the throne and the picture of the event in chapter number five. I think that gives us a good baseline of understanding. The rest of what I have today is much um, lighter. <laughs> And by that, I mean, what, what type of things should we expect? And I've had so many people ask so many questions about what to expect when we get to heaven. And, and a couple of things have, have triggered this recently in, in my, my own thinking. Um, uh, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here too today. Ready? Um, uh, as you know, our family has lost an unusual amount of dogs at one time. And all had different circumstances and all of them unrelated to one another. Uh, but we've lost a number of pets at one time. And so even my wife was, was, was saying, so what, what exactly does the Bible say about pets in heaven? You know, what, what does it say about it? So we, we dug into some of those things. Um, and I do know this. Uh, I think we've seen already, and we'll see a lot more in the book of Revelation, that there are definitely a lot of animals in heaven. A lot of animals in heaven. Um, the rest of it we'll leave for other discussion. But there's a lot of animals in heaven, no doubt about it. And so I began to um, uh, dig into what we do know about heaven. What, how much of it has become supposition or guessing, or how much does the Bible really say about it? And I, I wrote this down because I thought this was a, a, key, a key statement when we talk about heaven. Ready? Everything is better in heaven. But first and foremost, Jesus is there, Right? Jesus is not, uh, the, the person of Jesus Christ is not here with me. I understand Jesus' presence is always with me. Jesus is everywhere. He's omnipresent. I'm, I, please understand, I understand that. The Holy Spirit is with me from the moment I accept Christ. He's always with me. But physically, he's not with me. He's not talking to me. Not like the apostles had, right? As they, as they learned at his feet and understood at his feet and, and, uh, and worshiped at his feet, uh, the, 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 present, the, the physical presence, the being able to see Jesus Christ will be the first and foremost most important thing when we get to heaven. That will be there. You and I, by faith, believe. You and I obviously walk by faith and not by sight, but in heaven, we'll be able to see. And what, what a blessing that'll be. That'll be such a significant thing. That's why I wanted to start with chapter 4 and chapter 5 in building what we know about heaven. There'll be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. What a significant thing that is as all of us, right? As we get older and as we start to deal with more things or deal with more disease, deal with loss, deal with those things. There'll be no pain, no sickness, no death in heaven. There's no sin. There's no presence of Satan in heaven. No Satan in heaven. There'll be no more loss. There'll be no more despair. No more anxiety. No stress. I didn't write this down, but there's no schedule. Right? No schedule, no calendar. No clock ticking. <laughs> you know, got to get in. I'm already, I'm looking at the clock like, oh, I have so much to talk about. There's no clock, there's no schedule, there's no, there's no trying to get things done by a certain time, no, no sunset, no day over. My relationships in heaven will be better. Please understand, I, those that we have loved, that we have known on this earth, who have died without Jesus Christ will not be there. But the relationships that I have with those who are believers, my relationship with them will be better in heaven. Some of you have asked me through the years, and my wife and I have talked about this. You know, the Bible talks about that there's no marriage in heaven. Marriage is a uniquely earthly event. But for some of us, 
I'm going to say some of this tongue-in-cheek, all right? I've talked to some people who were happy about that, <laughs> unfortunately, you know. But for some of us that have had very good <laughs> marriages, uh, that doesn't look like a positive thing, right? Right? I mean, we, I, you know. And so my, my wife and I talk about that, you know. If, if my relationship with my wife is good, and it is on earth, won't my relationship with her be even better in heaven? Better. The dynamic is different somehow, right? The dynamic is different. But the, the relationship will be better. That's a blessing. That's nothing to be concerned about. That's a blessing we have. Those times that we have with the Lord. Think about that. My, my devotions, my prayer time. It's so insignificant. It's so short. It's so limited. But my time with him there will not be limited. And so my relationship with him will be much better. And my relationship with others will be better. And then I've, I've come to, 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 to this quote. Well, here, let me, let me give one other example. Something I thought was relatable. Something I've talked about lately. My son CJ and I talked about this the other day. I've never been a, I've never been a person worried about you know, envious or jealous I'm always very content with where God has put me. Uh, as I've taken some time to help CJ and uh, deliver and drop off uh, lawnmowers for his business, I, I told CJ, I said, your, your customers have very nice houses. You know, very nice. Uh, and most of his, just kind of roughly, most of his customers, people who buy mowers from him and then get them serviced, they're big, you know, um, zero-turn mowers. They probably have significant property. You know, most of them that uh, he's selling mowers to have acres of property. They're mowing a good bit of, of, of place. I think of Brother Wayne Wanger and how he used to mow all that grass on his uh, grasshopper zero turn. And, and there's people like that that have significant property. And I, even the other day when I was helping him out, um, he told me, he's like, this, this guy you're going to go see, he's like, turn where the mailbox is. He said, but that driveway is at least a quarter mile long. You'll be driving back there. And I did. I drove way back there. And after I drove for a while, the gentleman who owned the place was parked there. He met me. He said, follow me the rest of the way. And he took me back some more, way back and up past the house. And we drove across the field and back to a barn and a shed. And, and I thought, I didn't tell CJ this, but that was not the longest driveway I drove on that day. These people have beautiful places. And I I thought about that as I drove home that night and stopped at the stop sign with my house in front of me. I went, well, there's the money pit. <laughs> you know, there it is, the old farmhouse, you know. Uh, listen, the house that I have on this earth, and I thank God for my house. It's, it's a unique house. It's an old farmhouse. It has its ups and downs. I thank God for it. I know he's preparing a better place for me up there. And I don't have to worry about what I have here because he told me he's preparing a place for me up there. John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And I know that I don't have to get there and worry about whether he used 20-year shingles or 30-year shingles, you know. Is my bathroom going to freeze up this winter, you know? No, not in heaven. I praise the Lord for those things. You know, they, those things that I worry about here will not be an issue there. And I know that people that have quarter-mile driveways and beautiful homes, uh, the house does not make the home, never does. I also know that they have shingles that need replaced and pipes that freeze and everything else too, you know? We can look on the outward, but God has things prepared for us that are, are far better. And my home is temporal, right? It's just for now. It's just for this place. I'm just a, I'm just a pilgrim here, the Bible tells me. I'm just an ambassador sent here. He's preparing a place. But I want that to be of encouragement to you today. Because I'm probably not the only one who gets discouraged when we get in our old house or our old car or our old stuff and go, ah, must be nice the other, how the other half lives, you know. No. 
What, what is a joy and a privilege is what he is preparing for me someday. And I don't think that it's an accident that he told us that, that he, that he, that he gave us that insight. Like, don't worry about it. You're here for a time. Your life's but a vapor. It passeth away. We look at that as a negative. How about a positive? We're only here for a while. Look at what I'm preparing for you for eternity. Look at where you'll get to be. I, people have said before, and I, I've, I've, I've made this statement, um, that I used to worry about this as, as a kid. Um, am I going to be bored in heaven? Right? Am I going to be bored? What do we do there? I like to work. I like to work. I, I get... I get my satisfaction off of working. I like to be busy. I like to have projects. I like to have things to do and things to accomplish. I like to know I accomplished something that day. I like to work. What am I going to do in heaven? You know, again, the cultural perception is you float around on a cloud, you know, or something, you know? Obviously, that's not biblical. We're not floating around on clouds, and I, you know, what am I going to do? Sleep all day and get fat? No. Obviously, that's not God's plan for us there. I will be with Christ. I will be with loved ones. I will be with those that have gone on before us. I just don't think I'm ever going to get tired of hearing Moses tell us about the opening of the Red Sea. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they were cast into a fiery furnace. But what, how about story time every night in heaven, you know, or whatever? What, I, I know there's no schedule there, so it'll be hard to, hard to figure out when, but how about story time in heaven, right? As we hear the saints of old recount the places they've been. How about those that have gone on before us that had the gift of music that are able to have a concert in heaven? Imagine what that sounds like. Uh, chapter number four told us there was singing and proclaiming. Imagine the concert of heaven. The time that we have with him. We will have time of worship, of fellowship, of peace, of friendship. We're not going to have to get over hurt feelings. We'll be able to converse. We're not going have to have to sit there listening to uh, Elijah tell us another story and go, you know, I, I got to be somewhere, you know. No, nope. schedules don't matter those things are not a problem. The accounts of old will be, I think, news and, and, and information and excitement to us. I, I, I want us to have, listen, while we're on this earth, we have a job to do. And someone said to me this morning as they were walking in, well, God still has me here. He must have a purpose for me today. That's exactly right. We are called to do the job that we're given to do today, but praise the Lord, he's prepared a place in heaven for me. And it's something to look forward to. It's something to be excited about. Should not distract us from what he's called us to do today, but it's something out there as, a, as that incentive. I don't want to use that word uh, inappropriately, but as a, as a goal. For us who believe that this will be our eternal home someday, praise the Lord for that. Would it surprise me if I get to heaven, he shows me my abode, and a dog runs out to greet me? No, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. If all eight or ten of them run out, I don't know. I'm going to be like, wait a minute. All eternity? You know, hold on. You know, but no, anyway. I, I don't know what he has prepared for us. I don't know all, the, all the, the, the small nuances that are there, all the unique things. The Bible tells us there's more than could be written in the book. There's so much we don't know. There's so many things we, we have no idea what's in store for us. But the things that we do, what a blessing. What an encouragement they should be for us as we go through our daily walk of the Christian life. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through we praise the Lord for what he has laid up for us someday.